Joyce Bauer Mukhtari. She holds a Bachelor of Law degree from the Holborn College University of London, 1997. She also holds a Master's degree in Maritime Law from the International Maritime Organization, International Maritime Law Institute, Malta, where she was the recipient of the IMO Legal Committee Chairman's Award for the best of award performance in international transport law. She also holds a master's degree in conflict resolution and mediation from the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Center, Ghana. Joyce Bauer Mukhtari was formerly called to the bar in 2000 and she started her career with a firm say and co. Later, she became a consultant for KPMG and the Venture Capital Trust Fund and also served as a deputy minister. Good evening, you all. So, Basima is confident. She's phenomenal. She's beautiful. She's inspiring. She's intelligent. She's confident. Above all, Basima is selfless. She's caring. And I think she cares about you all. Tonight, we're here to celebrate the vision of Mami Amma Pratt, a fantastic young woman whom I met a few years ago when I actually went to a program at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. It was one of those very interesting ones. I don't remember now. We had a very fierce debate. And the conclusion was that we are both Amas, strong-willed, bold, intelligent. And I genuinely love to argue. I've always been one of those children. I must always have the last word, no matter what. Start it, I'll end it. Start in the middle, I'll start with you. End it, I'll start all over again. <laughs> and my mother was always at her wits and trying to keep me quiet and keep me in line. I was a third of eight children, so you can only imagine, and we only have one brother. And the rest of us are all girls. My brother also happens to be the sixth. So that means that he was actually relatively younger than all of us. Strong-willed, competitive, above all, very, 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 very hardworking women. And my father always had a joke that all his friends had male children. And each time they would tease him about how many girls he had and all the daughters and what have you. But somehow, many years later, he would look at us and he would say, oh, these beautiful daughters of mine. I'm sure my friends are all jealous now. Maybe they would ask for their sons to come and marry you. But somehow, I never really married. None of us actually dated or married any of them. But you know how those ones were. <laughs> Tonight, I think I am even more inspired. I believe that uh, we have some amazing women in our midst. The queen mothers look resplendent. And of course, Hajia CPP, as I call her, congratulations. You've just actually chalked one of those milestones that we don't celebrate very often. Now, as leader of the Convention People's Party, it's a fantastic thing for young women, especially for those of you who aspire to be politicians or to go into politics. I've just seen Suzanne Edua Mankwa, uh, one of those great examples of someone who is Obasima all through, married, a mother, a politician, a professional, name it. It is also instructive that we have Mr. and Mrs. Pratt here. It tells you the role that our parents play in our lives. The pride they have in us when we are successful. The pride they have in us when we take our lives into our own hands and do the things that make them happy. I believe that tonight we are here to see how one parent's vision for their daughter has turned out and how that vision is going to impact each and every one of us tonight, especially for those of you who are starting out, who need road models, who need great examples. I think Mami Amma Pratt is one of those very positive young people, and I know that this leadership <laughs> conversation that she started is actually going places. My big sisters are here, my bosses, my mentors, some from very close up, others from very far off. I have Auntie Esther Koba here. And I'd always watched her from a very long distance. But I remember, as fate will have it, when we were being groomed, being trained, 
in just how to start on this journey called politics. She was one of those people who took us through a few lessons in communication. She coached us. She taught us how to comport ourselves, how to manage ourselves in public light, and especially how to comport ourselves. So tonight, I think Anabasima is also epitomized by Auntie Esther Koba. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Professor Nana Ajima is another fantastic woman. You know, one of those very warm-hearted people. She reminds you of everybody's mother. <laughs> it's where the mothers that used to bake and advise you just about everything. Sort of mother who would stop and ask you why you're not at school, why you're not doing well in school, even when she didn't know you. I think Professor Nana has come to represent that big sister, that mother figure. It's sort of a light for our paths, really. And I think tonight it is instructive that we're here with Professor Nana. We just listened to the Honorable Gender Minister. She made a very personal and passionate statement about commitment, about dedication, above all, passion. We each have a talent. We are all born with a very unique gift. For some, it is a gift of a high intellect, very high IQ. For others, it's a gift of speaking. For some, it's to sing. For some, it is to do all sorts of things. I actually define myself in so many ways. I believe that I represent what my parents actually imagined, what they dreamt about, what they hoped for and looked forward to. Now that I'm much older, a lot of people tell me that I'm so much like my father. I didn't think that way before. Someone even said to me that, you know, even when you walk past me, sometimes I remember your dad. So tonight, I think that my being here is actually also testimony to the resolve of my parents, to my father's love and commitment for each and every one of us. And I've seen my younger sister here. Dr. Bawa, good evening. I thought I saw you because we are actually very, very tall and very distinctively tall. So when she walked and I sent her a text, I said, I mean, are you in the room? But of course, she never picks up her phone because Kolebu's made her something very, very antisocial. I'm surprised to see her here tonight. I'm sure you knew I was going to be here, so it was just as well. Pleasure. <laughs> so she's number seven. Yes, and our story goes and on. And of course, there's number eight who just graduated. So there's a lot of us. Very, very, very competitive. We have always been and still are. You'd find us having these very strange conversations. And we are some, you know, the sort of siblings that see each other like all the time. We talk all the time. We are in each other's homes all the time, even at our ages. And I know when I got married, my husband found it very awkward that we'll be at home and my siblings would just walk into our bedroom and then he'd come home and my younger sister is in my bed with me and we're chatting as if we live in the house together. We really haven't left home yet. I think we are still in the process. <laughs> but you know, tonight I think Obasima is all about positive energy. I thought very long and hard about the theme, Con empowerment or empowered for continuity. It tells you a story. It tells you that the journey really has begun. I thought I'd look at it through females trying to break through the glass ceiling, or the brass ceiling as we called it in the military when I tried very hard or ventured into going into the army. So I think tonight you can still see my posture, my gait, even the way I walk. And my husband tells me all the time, learn to walk slowly. <laughs> I think it's something I'm still learning to do. I'm always running somewhere. So I think sometimes, we dwell too much on the things that really don't matter. We focus more on what we think others want to see us do and why we expect people to see us. I think more than anything, Obasima stands for an individual, no matter where you find them, who sets an example, who stands tall in a room, who walks with her head held high, and who actually makes it a point to impact society in one way or the other. Of what use will our lives be if we didn't find a way to impact people positively? I had actually had a very, very varied career. I had always known from a very young age that I wanted to be a lawyer, so that was not in doubt. I think I was blessed and fortunate that grace made it possible for me to achieve all of that and more. I am still learning, and I believe that coming into politics for me was a new curve, a new paradigm shift. I'd gotten used to being in conference rooms. I'd gotten used to being a student, an intellectual. I'd come into an arena that actually was very different. 
an environment I wasn't used to, even though I'd come from a family of a long line of politicians. It had never crossed my mind. Funny enough, though, I was never very political when I was on campus. My younger sisters were, my brother was, but I was just one of those who just liked to follow on what was happening politically. But it was never really my calling until 2013. And even then, I thought about it long and hard. I asked myself, Joyce, you've always been you know, a mentor, you've been a role model, you've taken your career to another level. I was one of the youngest to graduate from the law class in 1999. And I do think that in many ways, I've achieved a lot more than I ever, ever imagined for my life on this earth. It's also beautiful to see a panel made up of people of all varied ages. And actually, when I saw the lineup, I said, damn, Mamiyama, I mean, this is something else. What are you expecting me to say when we have Professor Nana, we have Esther Koba, we have the Gender Minister? I'm probably a bit too young to be on this panel. Why don't you let me just be a participant? But of course, as always, she goaded me, she chided me, and probably fawned over me, making me feel like I was so, so unique and so special. So I made the point to be here. I think that women started this journey a very long time ago. My mother juggled through work and raising us, and she did a good job. The debate is still on, whether or not she was too harsh, whether or not she disciplined us too much, whether or not she made us work too hard at home. But she always has the same answer, and I'm sure I'm mean, nice smiling, because even a few weeks ago, this was a very heated debate when Clara dared to tell mom that she was a bit too harsh and the kids were complaining. She took us to town, and I remember her asking, look at how you guys turned out. And I think that whole weekend, each one of us who phoned her, she had the same conversation. The theme ran through. <laughs> Discipline is good. Hard work pays. See how I raised you. See how concerned you are about each other. See how you care about each other. See how you turned up. For my mom, really, I don't think our professions actually make a difference to her. I think she took it for granted. I think what matters to her is genuinely how we've all turned out as adults how we've raised our own kids and our own families. I think Obasima is a positive human being. All the challenges that have been raised in this room tonight, I'm sure we all can relate, we all can identify with. When it comes to the professions varied as they are, when it comes to our interests, they are just about equally varied. But when it comes to the psychological, the personal challenges that we encounter day in, day out, I do think that our problems probably match are you know, reminiscent of everyone else's. We replicate these stories every day. But of course, in all of this, there are those key individuals. The Esto Clues, the Nkulenu owner, who we celebrated a few days ago. We have Dr. Mary Grant, may his soul rest in peace. Madame Joyce Ayi, whom my father named me after, and I was looking forward to seeing her here. And I recall him always telling me I love that woman on campus. She was graceful. She was intelligent, she was smart. She was such a lady. And so for me, Madame Joyce Ayi has always represented that example of someone other than my mother who stands for a certain value that I hold dear. Stoicism, intellect, socially conscious. Above all, one of those few women that each and every one of us in this room can relate to young and old. Even over 70 years old and counting, she still stands for all the things that we hold dear. We want to be women of integrity. We want to be great examples. We want to be smart women. We want to work hard. It is very interesting that in all that Ghana has chalked historically, when you look at it in context, there's still so much more that we can achieve. I believe that since independence, we've had amazing females even pre-colonial days, we had Yaa Santua and all those examples. We heard about the example of the Makola woman who supported the independence challenge with her money, with her energy, and many other things. We watched the historic videos of all those women and the roles they played pre- and post-independence. We recall Osajifu's government and the few women who served in that government. As we speak today, the parliament that actually takes care of all of our interests in terms of our political discourse only has 13.5% as women. I think in that regard, we haven't done too well. If you look at the population of Ghana, statistically, women are actually about 50 plus, probably about 53% now and counting. 
So there's a lot more females than men. So why are we still failing to shatter completely that glass ceiling, to break through the brass? Are we looking at a virtuous woman who represents just someone who goes to church, who raises a family, who prays 24 hours a day? Or we are looking for a whole Obasima who is prayerful, who is graceful, who is hardworking, who represents something. And I think I take something away from what the Honorable Gen Gender Minister said, that it is not just about going to school, really. It is also what you do with that education. It is what you do with your life, really. It is how you turn out. It is also about the relationships that you have. But I've always learned one thing, that for me personally, having a great attitude will take you very, very far. I think it actually defines each and every one of us. When you meet somebody, what you take away is your first impression of the person. You meet somebody once and you dislike them instantly. You meet someone once and you know that they're not going anywhere. You meet someone for the first time, you can tell that this person is genuinely not very committed. I think we should learn to build on our attitudes. I personally recall that from a very young age, I was one of those very lucky ones. And I remember my class one teacher, actually, is still very much alive. And she follows me on Facebook, on social media, name it. And every now and then, she'll come to my page and she'll say something very, very interesting. I still remember you kids, you know? You were such amazing kids. I find it strange that you are always all together. Anytime you post something, I see each one of them comes to say something. And I always go back and say, Teacher Jane, you know something? We all took something away from your kitchen. And really, in Tamale, where we grew up at the time, she was an English woman who had married one of the very great lawyers we had, lawyer Araya Larson, and come to live in Tamale. So most of us from that crop of kids whose parents were lecturers of the academic fraternity actually ended up starting life in that kitchen. And she's 80 plus now and is so, so, so active on social media, sometimes it surprises me. <laughs> Until date, if you post something and there's a little error, she'd come back and she'll subtly correct it. She'll either put an apostrophe S or she'll put something there, but at least she'll tell you that she's read it and she thinks you could have said it better, you could have put it in this way, you could have probably been more succinct, name it. So sometimes you find out that when you become that example of a great, woman, of a whole woman, your teachers are proud of you and they share in your success. Even your community would hail you. Your environment would endorse you and the people you work with. When I listened to Sylvia today, in fact, when I saw the way she was dressed earlier, I thought, ah, is this a coast guard? Is this someone who's just at sea, at an adventure, or she's coming back? And to be honest, with all due apology, I didn't even recognize you then. And then when she spoke, I thought, okay, yes. I thought she looked familiar, but I wasn't sure. I had a very, very, very beautiful career as a corporate lawyer. But I'm one of those people I get very bored very easily. Somehow, at some point, I just got tired of all these negotiations and the law firm and going to work early and killing the hours and always trying to clock in the hours, of course. Of course, you do know that in law firms, we get paid depending on how many hours we put in. I decided to go and have lunch with a friend of mine. And whilst we were chatting, I looked at this, you know, the sea line and the recession of it. And I said to her, you know something funny? I've been thinking about all of these waters that we see all the time. And sometimes I ask myself, what are we going to do when the sea recedes so much that we probably will not know what else to do? When the pollution gets to an extent, where we suffer and the fish would suffer and our food chain would suffer and businesses would suffer. Then she said, oh, you know something? I saw this advert somewhere. There's one of these maritime institutions that's looking for a lawyer. And I thought, oh, but those places are very boring. You know, I need something more exciting than that. To cut a long story short, five years later, I had applied for that job. I had gone there as a head of the legal department. Six years later, I got a United Nations scholarship to go and study maritime law. Even when I was leaving, I wasn't too sure I wanted it. I think at the time, the then president had actually appointed me as a board chair for one of the parastatals. And a colleague of mine said, oh, JB, this is a very good place. I think you should stay. I thought, no, 
this scholarship is worth millions to me. It's so much money. In fact, when I went for the interview, there were about 120 of us, and only five of us made it to the next level. But I knew that of the five, I was certainly going to be the one to win that scholarship. And when it happened, I wasn't surprised. But of course, thank you. But of course, after I won that scholarship, I said to someone, I said, but you know, somehow I'm always studying on one scholarship or the other. From the COCO scholarship to the UN scholarship, there's always something that someone is paying for. I think when people do that for you, when society contributes to your life in this manner, it is also your responsibility to make a difference. It is your responsibility to take advantage of it, to do it and do it well. I remember at the time I was leaving for school, my son was just two. I'm one of those ones who only has a son. He's almost 12, and he's a fantastic little man. And so I said to myself, my mom said, you know, I did it with you. You were a year old when I went to Bath. I don't think it is impossible. You have a great family. Your husband is fantastic. I think you can do it. It was a very, very difficult decision. But I look back on it and I tell myself it was the best decision I ever made. It is the reason why I'm here with you this evening. If I had stayed in those courts in arbitration, in corporate law, I'd be making bus loads of money, speaking a lot of English, engaging a lot of people, drinking copious amounts of wine. And I told a friend of mine yesterday, I was used to the boardroom. I was used to the courts. I was used to the finer things of life until I came into politics and I realized that there could be some rough sides and rough edges to life. But all in all, I think it's also helped me. I used to be very sensitive. I always had to be the very best. If I was second best, it wasn't good enough. And so when I came into politics, I realized that it was actually a microcosm of all that is best everywhere else and of course the worst too. I think it has helped me be less sensitive I am also more conscious of my environment. Above all, I'm a touch more circumspect. Because you know how you get very careless in the professional lines. You know, you speak anyhow, you talk anyhow. You actually think that the world revolves around you. That everything is about wearing a great suit, making a great case, making some good money, and you know, just having a pretty much good life. But you come into politics and you see another side of life. You see the uninitiated. You see poverty like you've never seen before. Because most often than not, you lose sight of all these things because you're on that success ladder. You're on that career path that takes you away from the realities of life. You come into politics and there's still a whole new world waiting for you, as the Lion King will say. It was a whole new world. It was an awakening. You look at the poverty around us. For all those who needed so badly, just one person to support them who didn't get it. For all the opportunities that people lose because there's nobody really when they need it most to support them. I think it's the reason why we are here. Obasima is that woman who finds time to help the less fortunate, who finds time to support those who are not as blessed as you are who makes time like tonight to be here with you, even when my son has been calling me all evening and asking why I'm not home. But I also understand that it's important to share with all of you young people. I think most often than not, we try so hard to be somebody else. But I think you can still be yourself, irrespective of where you find yourself. I found that coming into politics, I pretty much stayed the same. Even when police people were guarding everybody and military people were guarding people, I just thought that was just too much. For me, it would be interfering with my privacy, it would just be in my way. I still wanted to be JB and just stay very normal. I think in many ways, I tried to stay the same. I continue to have enormous faith in the fact that God would take Ghana to the next level. I believed in one way or the other that I'd contribute my quota and I say one thing all the time, and I think my father used to say, but at that time, it didn't make a lot of sense, that politics gives you a platform like no other. It gives you a very wide ambit. It gives you leverage. I know most often than not, you hear all those complaints. And recently, I had a chat with an honorable member of parliament. She said, you know, I'm going to stop this job. I said, why? She said, oh, my constituency is very far. It is so, so stressful. 
I have only recently remarried and I get home very, very late. You know, my son is 21 and I never have time to stay with him. I actually, I could relate. I understood what she was saying. But I also believe that the 13.5% that we are all complaining about is not good enough. So it's actually awe-inspiring that we listen to the gender minister telling us how she came into politics. I think it pretty much happens that way for a lot of women because most often than not, we approach it with trepidation, with anxiety. You're not even sure how you're going to survive. I think that when you talk about breaking barriers in a male-dominated world, it is that we must work to encourage one another. I think Madeleine Albright puts it very beautifully that any woman who gets to a certain stage, a certain level in life, who has not raised another woman, it means that that whole journey has been worthless. It's probably meant nothing. If all we came into this world to do is just to raise our own kids, to make them great citizens, to make them great adults, to give them all that they needed and we didn't affect other people other than ourselves, then what would it be worth? I think in all the things that we do, we must work very, very hard to touch lives, to make sure that whatever we stand for, that others are able to participate, to partake, and to enjoy it as well. I think that life is a whole adventure, and every day new worlds are open to us, new challenges, we meet new people, I listen to someone talk extensively about being someone's mentor. I think it's fantastic. But I think that a mentor must also have positive energy. You must be able to inspire. You must have a vision that others can feed into, even if privately. Above all, you must also be the type to rise up to the occasion, even when you're not sure what you're doing or what it is that you intend to do. My brother has a very interesting term, just do it. And I think Nike puts it beautifully. You wake up every morning to exercise, and you know how hard it is. I'm actually at my smallest ever. In Form 3, I was probably about twice the size. Somewhere in 2001, I took up tennis, and I started to exercise. And I realized that my life became so much easier. All you have to do is wake up a bit early. And even for my slimmer sisters, I tell them all the time, if you don't exercise, you definitely will not be acing your medical tests like I do. And my medical results are still a challenge to all of them because each day I tell them, just wake up at 4.30 in the morning. Obasima is very energetic. Obasima is probably married or a single mother. Obasima is that woman who has no husband, no child, but has adopted a little child. And I have many friends who have done that and are successfully parenting other kids. Obasima is a very well-educated, very well organized, rounded person. Obasima has time. Obasima is full of sacrifice and love. But above all, Obasima has a great attitude. Thank you. Thank you so much, JB. Okay. Please, are you ready for us? We are ready for you. Please let it, let it go.